Hello and welcome Global Hospitality Summit attendees. My name is Leora Lance, and I am really pleased to be here with you today to facilitate this discussion on hospitality leadership of millennials and Gen Z in today's workforce. Allow me to introduce myself for a moment, and then I will introduce our, my guests and our panelists who are with me today so that you can get a sense of what we're all about and what we bring to this conversation. I am the Assistant Dean of Academic Affairs at Boston University School of Hospitality Administration. I am also chair of our master's program and I am associate professor of the practice, which means that I come from industry and I'm very fortunate to have had a wonderful career path um, bringing me to this point. I spent the last 15 years before joining Boston University as global director of marketing for hospitality consulting firm HVS. Prior to that, I spent nearly a decade in marketing and public relations for ITT Sheraton Hotels of New York. And prior to that, I was the director of public relations for the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. So my background is in tourism, lodging, hospitality, investment. I'm very grateful to the Global Hospitality Summit organizers because I've had a chance through this experience to meet Craig Sullivan and Kyle Allison. So I'm really thrilled to introduce them to you now too. Craig is the founder of the California Lodging Investment Conference or CLIC, as we just saw in the video, the only lodging conference focused exclusively on California and its hotel market. He has served in executive positions and business development roles with CDO, Broughton Hotels, 24-7 Hotels, and he served as VP and manager of North American Title Company's hotel group, which he created. He has helped underwrite and close nearly $25 billion worth of hospitality and hotel transactions. He was named one of the top 50 hospitality leaders in 2021 by the International Hospitality Institute. And so we welcome Craig Sullivan. Kyle Allison, Kyle, you might want to give a wave too. He's the host of Hospitality MD, a podcast. He's also an award-winning win documentarian, and he is a hotelier. His hospitality story began when he was six years old. He transformed his home into a hotel. He offered housekeeping, he had in-room dining, and he had all kinds of amenities and services for the family to enjoy. Since then, he's taken that hospitality spirit and turned it into his career. And he spanned working at 10 different hotels in five different US states, ranging from 146 to nearly 1200 hotel rooms. Currently, Kyle is catering sales manager at the number one double tree by Hilton Hotel in the brand, located in Reading, Pennsylvania. He is responsible for selling and managing and executing the on-site and reach, recently launched off-premise catering service for the hotel. Welcome to Craig and to Kyle. Thank you, I want, Laura. That was great. Uh, well, you. that's your backgrounds that are great. So I'm really glad to be with you. And I'm, again, very grateful that we had the chance to get to know each other over these last few months and share in this conversation and prepare this discussion. I just want to set the tone before we get going for our attendees. Um, Craig, you are sharing the perspective as an owner, as a manager, you're an acquisitions guy, you're a deal maker, you're an asset manager, and for perspective, you're a boomer. Yeah. Kyle, you are the perspective of that cusp of Gen Z and millennial. You are operations focused, you're an employee, and so you bring that perspective to this conversation. My perspective, I am on a cusp myself, the boomer and Gen X generations, but I've been very privileged to work with and teach and mentor the Gen Zs and millennials for these last seven years. And so we bring those perspectives to this conversation. I want to set the, the scene for a moment and then we'll get into our questions. I just want to share with you while we come from lodging, we are really talking about hospitality as best as we can in a general perspective. I can share with you that the master's program, for example, for which I chair, we focus on hospitality beyond traditional lodging, beyond traditional restaurants. It includes senior living. It includes healthcare. It includes hospitals. 
It includes workplace experiences. We focus on human interactions for positive experiences. So I wanted to set that tone because while we come with lodging backgrounds, we really are trying to uh, put hospitality into this general sense with some of the questions and conversations that we have. So let's get started. Um, and I mentioned career, Kyle, because you have made this your career, your career focused hospitality professional. So let's start with this question. What steps do we need to take to modify or change how we think about people's strategies in this business, the culture of the workplace, the treatment of associates? Craig, would you like to get that started? I'd be glad to. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, one of the things that we need to stop doing are these long, contiguous hours um, that helps to burn good people out. It doesn't get new team associates trained properly. You know, it, it's going to come down to a little bit of give and take with everybody. Um, you know, with, without your associates at the property level happy, everything else falls apart. So you've got to take care of that. Um, we're, we're coming through a horrific time for hospitality globally, and we've got to rethink and have a shift in the way we're doing things. But I think it really starts with those ungodly hours. We all give up and have given up holidays. Okay. So, you know, maybe the benefits package also needs to change a few more personal days off, things of that nature. And I think if you've got your team happy and they're taking pride in what they do and they're taking pride in the asset everything else falls into place and the economics are going to work out so it sounds like focus on the associate first focus yes. on the employee first and we're yes. going to talk about benefits momentarily too kyle i know you've got some strong opinions on this as well what do we need to take to modify how we think about people's strategies in hospitality i i think it's quite simply a return to the roots and foundation of what hospitality is as a philosophy and as a profession. I mean, uh, we feed people uh, when they have nothing to eat. We house people when they have nowhere to stay. Um, and I think the way that we train and talk to people who are coming into the industry needs to reflect the intimate and noble nature of the hotelier and of the hospitalitarian uh, as being somebody who's trusted to keep people safe, trusted to um, with these very deeply intimate moments and experiences in people's lives. Um, so yeah, we need to move forward, but we also need to look back and remember who we are and what we came from. Uh, and, and, and I think that's one of the main keys to, um, to managing young people now is remind them that what they're doing serves a big purpose in other people's lives. I love that. It, it's really resurrecting and rejuvenating the noble profession that it is. It's really taken a beating and just we're not respected that way anymore. So how do we help make that happen? And Craig, it seems as if from some of the attendees here, you've definitely struck a chord with some of the suggestions that you made. So Zana and Stephanie, we see your comments and, and that's great because we're all in alignment here in terms of where we need to begin. You know, in terms of modifying people's strategies, let's talk about values. And we saw even some of our attendees put some of those values into the chat here. What values are important to the workforce today? And Kyle, this is addressed to you specifically simply because you are the millennial in the room and Craig and I need to hear this as do our peers. Um, not that we would disagree, but we want definitely your voice here. So what are the values that are important for this generation of workforce and hospitality? Well, I think these are the values of of young people and, and most people everywhere, not even just in hospitality. I think we see this, you know, in terms of labor shortages and in terms of um, turnover rates in hospitality more than in other industries, um, primarily because we are the, the maybe one of the main industries who has historically um, not abided by what people's kind of wishes and wants are and desires and what they value. So young people today 
we value work-life balance, plain and simple, as a whole. And I'm speaking very broadly here. Um, but I think, just like Craig said, we want flexible hours for people. Um, so they, I, I see this all the time, people saying, I shouldn't have to give up my life for my job. Um, you know, uh, you work to live, not live to work. Um, and I think that that's, that's one of the main um, pain points right now that people have is that it's, it's not, we're not there yet. And that's why we see uh, that we, we can't find enough help or we have turnover, et cetera. Corporate social responsibility is big. Um, again, I, I talk about the nobility of, of the hotel in, in a community. And, you know, I think people want to, they want to see that that's a value that we have. And, and it's pretty much all encompassing. We can take steps to show people that we care about the role of the hotel and community. And it's also simultaneously a value of, of young people uh, that have purpose and meaning in their jobs. You know, Craig, we've had a couple of discussions sort of as the boomers talking about work-life balance. And I've, I remember saying to you, cause I've had this discussion at home. I shared this with you, Craig, you know, maybe we were dumb back then, you know, when we were in our twenties and thirties, we did it cause we had to, we didn't know any better. Um, you know, in terms of work-life balance. Would love your thoughts on that, Craig. No, I agree. And you know what? Something that has been perpetuated from the Bob Hope generation all the way to date was that generation isn't as good as us. They don't work as hard as us. They want more. They, they do less. And that nonsense needs to end. It really does. Um, every, de- every generation is different. Now, I had the good fortune of being born into the boomers, okay? Now, if you look at that time frame, we weren't responsible for a lot of things until possibly ending the Vietnam War, okay? Um, That was all the Bob Hope generation doing different things, economic growth, everything else. Now, I remember getting into... The, into, into a work mode in the 70s where we had double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, uh, you know, double-digit interest rates. And I never thought we'd see anything like that again. Well, lo and behold, I was wrong. 2008 rolled around and, you know, again, we tank. But we need to really listen to Kyle and the other generations and hear what they're saying, understand what they're saying, And we also have to provide a better work environment. I am really hoping that the brands will take the lead on this. You've got to stop putting people in a basement without windows. Okay. That does not help your your work scenario at all. Trust me, been there, done that, won't do it again. The new designs of the hotels, you've got to incorporate the workspace. You've got to, you know, besides the flexible hours and things like that, you've got to provide something that helps them, that motivates them, lets them know that there's an outside world there as well. And I, I just think that, you know, we this generation that's coming up, Kyle and, and the next generation, these are, the, these are our future leaders, and we need to listen to them. We need to get on the same page with them. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult task, you know, for sure. Um, we still have a lot of mentality out there. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, guess what? That doesn't work anymore. And we need to move forward. And this has got to be a partnership. It's got to be following into a lot of different things that I know that we're going to get into later in the conversation. Sure. Sure. And you know what I want to, you mentioned a few things, Kyle, I don't want to cut you off. I just know one other thing that you mentioned when we chatted in the past about values. And I do want you to bring up is proper pay, you know, um, because Kyle, uh, Craig, you just mentioned, stop putting folks in the basement. I'll tell you as someone who has just now taught seven years of undergraduate and graduate school, alums now, graduates working, and I've got someone who's doing revenue management working in a basement, having to wear a suit and tie when he doesn't have a guest facing situation and he's got no contact with the outside world. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Hmm. And then when it comes to pay, I I even had this conversation with my students yesterday in a class because of a recommendation we're making for a project. Um, 
I, I, the number of unpaid internships that I did to get ahead right. enough, people yeah. are working pay. So exactly. Ky- Kyle, I would love your thoughts on that. Cause you, you, do, you definitely brought that up when we chatted a few times. Yeah, definitely. And, and also just to kind of Craig, you mentioned, you know, this financial crisis in 2008, among many crisis that young people have been through recently with COVID, everything else, there's, there's an existentialism and nihilism Mm -hmm. among young people, um, which I think is important to highlight as we talk about the nobility of the hotel and the community, as we talk about um, the values that people have, the values that young people have, including proper pay and including working in an environment with, uh, with windows and access to life and, and, um, work-life balance, all these things that we talk about, people have have seen, young people have seen that it's pointless in their eyes. It's, it's a, again, a sense of existentialism. It's pointless to toil away for the man, you know, in the ivory tower. Um, it, and it's just, it's not something that we're really willing to tolerate so much anymore. Um, and I think that's something that everybody should keep in mind no. Look at, at young people who who are seeing tragedies on their phones every day and 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 stuff like this for for decades or for you know it's, this is all that we've known this is all that we've seen um, and it affects people's psychology and it affects their values so I want to say that and I think that's precisely one root cause of the proper pay issue um, people have seen too much exploitation of people. And they don't want to be a part of that themselves, um, like unpaid internships, for example, uh, like you mentioned. I think that's a, a great example. Um, you're going to go into a hotel or a restaurant and um, wash dishes for for 10 or 12 hours a day as an internship to get experience, and you're not going to get paid for it. It feels like exploitation. That's how people are feeling about it. Craig, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. And, you know, it's it's not just at that level. I mean, that that's permeated up through Wall Street as well. And they've had their share of scandals over that. Um, it, it's got to be about pay for an internship. And it's also got to be about that grade. And you know what? A long time ago, people would start out with intern programs as far as early as high school. Okay, you could get a work permit here in California. You were allowed to work X amount of hours if you were under 18 and a student. Um, And those programs built the next job force. It was the next generation that was going to take over. And they had, you know, quite a lot of programs and, and they spent time crafting them and getting the right people in the right position. And that's something that I think we also need to get back to. But this this no pay uh, that that's that's done. Those yeah, days enough are over. of that already. And it was yeah. it was really interesting for me to to I, I've said this for the last few years, but just as recently as yesterday, as I said in in one of my classes, we were making recommendations for a, a hotel actually, and I said to the students, "Enough with the yeah. unpaid internships. That's done. Move on." Um, Speaking of benefits and values, you know, if you recall a decade ago, these fun offices were being built in different companies, not necessarily hotels, but for different uh, companies, hospitality or, or otherwise, with the ping pong table in the middle of the office and the bar set up so people could have that break in the middle of the day and then a little sleeping lounge, right? Sort of those sort of nouveau maybe in the high tech companies. And so sure enough, we were talking about this and I found this study. Now, granted, the study was commissioned pre-COVID. This is a few years old already. This is 2017, but this is a study commissioned by Sage people. It spoke to 3,500 global employees, global workers to uncover what do they really want from their employers? And here's what they found. Fewer 
folks were favorable on these sort of games in the office, such as ping pong, 6% saying they value it as part of the work experience, only 6% of those 3,500 folks. In fact, in some cases, people felt that these types of activities and games that we thought were going to make people feel good actually do more harm than good. That more than half, 55% of the respondents said they actually are distracting and they actually decrease productivity. So with that said, what are meaningful benefits? Because the ping pong table in the office isn't that. So Craig, can we start with you for, for that? I got to tell you, it's not a water slide in a pool either. Okay? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I worked for Broughton Hotels and we had a, a program and play during the summertime. So most of the team at the office married with children, okay? Or single parents with children. Summertime was an issue. So, you know, they could have some daycare possibly in the morning and then, you know, the, the expense and all of that went up dramatically as you got into the afternoon hours. So we'd have a Friday morning meeting with the, with the team in the office, go over what we've accomplished, where we fell short, did all that. Noon, everybody was able to go work from their homes, especially you know, the, the people with families. Okay. Now my son's 40, so that didn't apply to me, but I had that option if I wanted to. Um, so I think those are some of the benefits. I think some of the other benefits, you know, that, that you need to give is, is besides the healthy environment, you've also got to provide a few other amenities, you know, for the team itself whether it's a spa fitness membership, it's, you know, getting good food delivered, not the pizza party once a month, those type of things. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's going to be a dramatic change. It may cost a little bit more right now on the front end, but it will pay dividends. You've got to look at your team and you've got to take care of them. And then you're going to build a career with your company. Um, a lot of people, myself included, I, I spent all, nearly 40 years working in publicly held corporate America. Now, I was fortunate enough after bouncing around for a number of years, I ended my career and spent 25 years at the company I'd started with as a teenager. Uh, now, they had a few name changes, so it wasn't exactly the same. But, you know, it, it, it afforded me to come back in, in more of a position where I could have an impact, not just with the client base, but with the team members in our office as well. And, and we, had a, we had a great run. It, it really was. And I think it's because we had multi-generational. Things had changed. I was able to implement a few things. And it's always about putting your team first. And, you know, there, there's three magic words that everybody should be using. Please and thank you. Enough said there. Thank you, Craig. Kyle, what would you like to add to that in terms of what are some of these benefits that are meaningful? Sure. Well, first, I want to point out, you know, you mentioned this, this survey, right? And 55% of people said that they are distracting and decreased productivity. And we have these Google type ping pong tables and all that kind of stuff, which is interesting. Did, did anybody think that employees cared about productivity or was that only the managers who were supposed and the executives who cared about productivity? People still care about that because they want to feel like they're doing a good job and they don't want to feel like they're lost in the sauce in the whirlwind um, and, and not accomplishing anything. So I think that's just something to say, you know, something about that. So in terms of benefits, you know, I, I just think a little gray area is always good um, when we're in a hospitality business. Um, a quick anecdote, we had somebody here at my hotel, which is the number one in the entire brand globally. So let's keep that in, in mind as well. We had somebody here who was sick and they were off work and they ran out of sick days because somebody 10 years ago who was the smartest person in the room said, hey, this is how many sick days somebody gets at our company. Well, we have somebody who's great, who shows up to work every day, who was going through something. They ran out of sick days. And what did we do? We gave them more sick days. And because now we have somebody who 
would not only be sick, but also be in financial distress because they, they're not getting paid for being sick. And now we have double issues compounding. Oh, and then what happens? They leave or they turn over what, and now we're losing more money. Gray area is, is highly critical in hospitality when we're dealing with the guests, but we should also take it into consideration with employees as well. And I know what everybody's thinking. We can't do that because then somebody's going to say, wait, I didn't get more sick days. It, first of all, that doesn't happen when you care about people. And also I recommend just keeping a diary and HR of what you do for people. For that girl, we wrote it down in a diary. Hey, mm -hmm. during this unique circumstance, we gave X amount of sick days as a, um, as a, as a courtesy for that person. And we do the same for other courtesies that we extend to people as well. Um, you're not going to get a lawsuit. And if you do, have your diary ready to go to court. <laughs> so a little gray area goes a long way. If I may for a minute, Craig, and I do want to turn it over to you because there's a number of comments in here and we've got to address some of them before we go into our other questions. And I know we're limited with time, but I want to address some of the comments in here. And Rob and yours is in particular, I want to, I want to talk to, but you know, you have to be careful, right? As an employer, as an owner, yeah. if you do for one, you got to do for all. And how do you keep it fair? So that's something to keep in mind. And all of these benefits cost, they cost money. So someone's got to pay for this somewhere. And so there's a lot of issues. It's easier said than done, but it can be done. So Craig, I want your help here because Robin, you chimed in here, awesome conversation, but who's going to deliver this message to leadership? The ones who have the power who actually can make the change. I'll just interject a thought. And then Craig, I'd like to, to have you handle that for there for a second. Robin, here's what I would tell you. I think the last 18 months in particular have just surfaced so much, not just in our industry, but globally and in society. Anything from focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, DEI and J, to you know, worker satisfaction because of the labor shortage that our industry is seeing now. Clearly there's there's the issue that to be had. We are seeing companies taking steps from the top, up, bottom up, top down. It's starting. So leaders are paying attention. So I don't want you to think they're not. They're paying attention. And some companies can handle them just because of size. And some have mass scale. Craig, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of things going on here. I, I think, one, your HR department needs to be brought up to speed. And my humble opinion, most HR departments, they're, they're bathroom monitors. They really are. Um, I know that's going to upset a lot of people, but it can't constantly be no. You've got to listen to the associates and not just make sure that they're checking in on time. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, it starts, you know, both directions, bottom up, top down. And I think we've got a really unique point in time where everybody is looking at that. I think, you know, if you do a two-year review of your portfolio, okay? You take a look at all of your hotels, where you've dropped balls, where you've excelled, see what the market is, see what your associate, your team, you know, satisfaction is. I think that's where a lot of that starts. And I think that, Kyle, you as an associate, if you get to have input, don't you generally feel good about that? Certainly everybody. And I think there was even a comment that came through here about everybody wants to have a voice and yeah. feel heard. Um, you know, when in a group of people, if you're having a conversation in a group of two, three or four people, and you're telling a story and somebody starts another conversation while you're in that group, you feel really hurt about that. And you feel embarrassed. Right. The same thing socially is happening when you're in an organization and you have something to say and nobody wants to listen to you. It's just our basic human nature to want to be listened to. So we shouldn't reject that. We should embrace it. If I may, I see here, Michelle, you've got a comment on wellness. I want to share with, and you can't be more right. 
I want to share here at BU at Boston University, the focus of the, and the direction, the forward thinking of our master's program right now. And I mentioned how we focus on human interaction for good experiences. We focus on the individual interaction. And so wellness is actually getting integrated into our hospitality teachings. And I also see a comment here from John Paul, academia working together with the industry to address some of these issues like unpaid internships or policies. I can tell you our dean of Naja is heading a group of hospitality deans and directors on various issues including trying to encourage more under uh, individuals from underrepresented groups yep. to become professors of hospitality so we have more role models but I, I I couldn't agree with you more and if you are game I'm happy to connect with you and, and let's see what we can do together so I wanted to address some of the comments here we only have a few minutes left so I want to make sure we do address some other things that Craig and Kyle and I thought were important to share with the group who is joining us today uh, we talked about some of the benefits Craig you and I've chatted about this do you feel we're at a crossroads right now in terms of workplace experiences, especially whether it's at the property level, company level, restaurants, hotels? We've used words cross crossroads, watershed moment. Do you think we're at this pivotal point right now in our industry's history? I do. Um, you know, I, I, I think the the pandemic, uh, you know, brought it uh to bear a little bit quicker, but I think you know, we've been sitting there since the financial meltdown. Uh, you know, kind of in a holding pattern on it, but now we're being forced to for, you know, some of the reasons I think, you know, one, we've done a horrible job of recruiting talent for the best profession in, in any industry. Um, I made a transition over to hospitality 27 years ago. If I hadn't, I'd probably be selling t-shirts out of a kiosk at, an, at the Automoana Shopping Center in Hawaii. Uh, kept my attention, love the people. They're the brightest and the best. We got to treat them that way. Okay. There is nothing worse than feeling invisible. Okay. Every time I'm in a hotel and I see it in a team member, I say hi to them. Okay. Two full one. I want, to, I want to acknowledge them and let them know that I know that they're a vital part of my experience at the hotel. And two, um, I want to see what their reaction is. You know, some of them look down and kind of mumble hello. Others get, they engage you. Okay. And we need to get everybody engaged. And, you know, if, if you're feeling invisible, whether it's at the property level or the corporate office, there's some serious problems. Those companies are not going to, to survive. It's just that simple. You know, I wanted to ask, what do we do? Where do we go from here? And Craig, you and I have checked about this. Let's talk about promotion for a moment. Yeah. And the, the time frame. That's big. Want to just, Kyle, do you want to sort of address that quick? And then Craig, you can add a thought on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's hugely important uh, to the young person. Um, I, I don't think anybody, even young or old, honestly, I think it's just young people have way too many options to just accept what people are delivering to them. But I'm sure anybody of any age would agree with this. You don't want to feel like you're toiling away with no end in sight, um, right. with no light at the end of the tunnel or opportunity for growth or a way to the next milestone. Um, so if people are eager and they want to grow, you know, they don't, I'll use the example of the housekeeping supervisor. If you're a housekeeping supervisor, it's a hard job, but it's not rocket science. You don't need to inspect rooms for four years straight, day in and day out, to no. then now be eligible to be promoted. Um, I think we underestimate the uh, it's uh, simple, but it's not easy. We underestimate the simplistic nature of some of these middle management roles in hospitality. And I think with the proper engagement and training, we can accelerate people a lot quicker. Craig, any thought on I that? Agree. Well, I agree. Sure I think you've got to question. support your associates. It, it gets back to education, you know, and that's, that's the key to everything, whether, you know, it, it's going to your hotel program or International Hospitality Institute, You've got to be able to offer those things. You've got to have flex hours. You've 
got to promote from within and identifying that talent cross training, I think is, is, is critical, especially right now with what our labor force is um, healthcare. Those, those are all things that, that we need to, to take care of. And I think, uh, you know, it's, we're at a point now where I think we're having that aha moment. We're at that crossroad and we're re recognizing it. And what we did a year ago is not going to fly going forward. You know, Kyle, you mentioned the opportunity for advancement. I would just add with because it's not rapid enough in some cases, we lose good people from hospitality to other industries because they can progress faster. The other thing I would say is I'm hoping for the folks who I addressed a few moments ago about what's the industry doing. You know, we are seeing companies hiring chief people officers. Notice the word people in yeah. those titles. So I think we're going in the right direction because the focus is on people. So I just wanted to share that thought. Um, you know, if I, I know could for a second, sure, Craig. You know, the, the average GM, their lifespan in a hotel is about four and a half years. Now, I was amazed when I found that out. I, you know, you would think people would be there a lot longer. The AGM, you know, they're, they're disappearing. They're, they're gone. Uh, they they were able to get promoted outside at another company. So if you don't take care of your people, they're gone. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. Um, any other recommendations for understanding various generational needs? I know, Craig, mentoring was important. I think mentoring, it, it doesn't matter what your age is. I can learn from Kyle. Kyle can learn from me. Leora, we could learn. Keep me in this too, yes. You. Yeah, okay. and that's why that's why I'm in a university setting. To be honest yeah. with you, I might be I, teaching, I, but I, I'm I, learning as much from my students as as they are from me. So I I, I use two examples all the time. Tom Gachet over at Davidson Hotels, CEO and president. He started out as a doorman. He knows what it's like to be that hourly associate. Chris Green at Chesapeake's another one. He started out on the F and B side and has a real passion for that, and. I had him on my show the other day and we were talking about, it. he goes, Craig, what changed my perspective was putting the associates first. If I do that, everything else will fall into place. He's right. Without the associates, what do you have? You've got an empty building. You've got phones ringing, food not being served, drinks not being made. Bed's not being made, okay? It, you, you've, got, you've got to mentor them. You've got to find those people that you, you know, that what's their passion? Where do they want to be in a two to three year period? Cut out this four, five, six years, you, you know, cross train them, get them into different things. Kyle, what you're doing is exciting, okay? Not only are you taking care of catering inside the building, but outside as well. And that's that's a dramatic change. There aren't a lot of you know companies that are gutsy enough to do that. And you know, I I I, I want to hear where you're at 12 months from now and how you have expanded and grown not only the the on-site events, but the external events as well. I think I think that's I'm all about you know revenue and monetization of every square inch, as long as it does not upset the guest. So stop the resort fees and stop the urban destination charges as well. Oh, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> so listen, we are at that moment. And what I will do, if you don't mind, Craig, I'm going to paraphrase for you your last word, which is go back to being people centric and people yeah. first. I would like to say for my last word, Innovation doesn't mean technology all the time. Innovation could be being creative and solutions focused with yeah. any element of the job that affects people. And Kyle, I'd love for you as the millennial in the room to have the last word before we get told time's up. Yeah, Your last thank word. you. Thank you both. It's been an honor being here. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. It means a lot. What are we talking about today is culture. Uh, yeah. Culture should be the North Star. Culture should be the compass for how we operate our hospitality organizations. Don't be the smartest person in the room who has all the answers. Establish a culture and let that be the compass for how decisions are made. 
Um, that's how millennials and Gen Z in the new workforce should be managed is by a culture first philosophy. And those of us boomers with millennial mindsets too, I may add. <laughs> so with that, thank you for those of you who, who talked with us and shared with us. We're really grateful. Thank you, Global Hospitality Summit, because for me to get to be friends with Craig and Kyle through this process,